Hello everyone and welcome to the first Sydney Game Developers Meetup of 2022. I actually remembered what year it is. Yay me! Um, I've still been saying 2021 for a while now, so go figure. Um, yes, this is our first for the year and we're getting kicked off with um, what is going to be a very good talk. Uh, Luke is, he's well, an expert. He is an actual expert software engineer. That is his title at Wargaming Sydney. And not only with Wargaming Sydney, but he's also got a very storied history. Um, it's been slightly blocked by my microphone at the moment, but you might be able to see the statue from Reach. Um, one of the titles that Luke has also worked on, as well as the Wargaming title. So yes, he has a lot of experience to bring to the table, and he's going to have some fantastic tales for us tonight. Um, before we get started, if you do enjoy the stream, Give us a like, think about giving a subscribe. It, does, it definitely does help and puts this video in front of more faces so, so more people get to learn more about us. Um, and also, while I have you, before I hand you over to Luke, um, you'll see a little link just down here. Um, Wargame in Sydney is hiring at the moment. We've got a fair number of jobs open at the moment because we are actually growing. We are working on some really, really exciting stuff that I can't tell you about. But if you like the sound of stuff that's exciting, um, maybe have a look at our job page and see if there's a role in there that would suit you. And certainly feel free to apply. If there's more questions you have about any of the roles that we've got open, hit us up on the socials. We've got our own Twitter. Um, you can look up me on LinkedIn, all that good stuff. And we'll be able to help you out with any questions that you might have. Um, okay, without further ado, I can see that Luke is ready and raring so i'm gonna hand you all over to him now enjoy everybody luke it's all yours now all right thanks paul uh good day everyone my name's luke libich and as paul said i am an expert gameplay engineer at wargaming sydney and today i would like to talk to you guys about prototyping so a little bit about myself I've been an engineer for 20 years now, and it took me quite a while to actually get gainful employment in the games industry. But over that time, I've been making games in one way or another while being a software engineer, among other things. I have a quite eclectic range of experiences. I started off with a master's in robotics on little indoor robots and computer vision, and then started fixing life support systems here in Sydney before I moved to the States to work on general software. I started working on games at Microsoft and I spent the majority of time at Bungie where I worked on Halo and the Destiny series. About four years ago, I moved back to Australia and I've been working for Wargaming ever since. Now, during my time at Wargaming Sydney, I worked on several different teams and projects, but mainly working on de-risking new technology or directly with game prototyping. So I worked on the technical prototype for AR streaming, which we took to Gamescom in 2018. It was very cool. You had the tank in AR. And I was also the lead for the prototyping team, which developed several internal prototypes within Wargaming that unfortunately not made it to the light of day yet. And currently, I am a lead on a multidisciplinary team working building gameplay content for an unannounced title that I cannot talk about either. Which brings me to the big disclaimer of this talk. Uh, a lot of the content that's gone into this talk is in games that are in production. It comes from internal projects, game jams, personal endeavors, and a lot of the content is still in production and has not been announced, which means I cannot show it directly. In a lot of cases, I've gone back and I've had to reproduce the issues in sample projects or whatnot to capture material. So while the experiences are real, I've had to generalize some of the visual and the content. Now, what should we talk about when we talk about prototyping? The big thing I want to come across for this is the importance of polish when you're prototyping. Because over the course of all the prototypes I've worked on, there is always this ideal to work quickly, where speed is prioritized over quality. Now, this often stems from a need. Prototyping budgets are often heavily constrained, both in money and time. However, experience has taught me that if you polish the right aspects of a prototype and improve the quality of it over the speed you develop, you can greatly improve your effectiveness of how you prototype and the results you get. So the purpose of this talk is to sell you on the idea that quality the polishing brings has a lot of value and to impart with you like knowledge and processes for identifying what to polish to get the most out of it and hopefully a successful prototype at the end. So I'll start with talking about what prototyping in games means to me as this forms a basis of evaluating the techniques I present. And then I'll dive into a set of questions that you can ask when you start prototyping 
to sort of evaluate it for where Polish can benefit you the most. Then I'd like to double down on what I consider to be the most important aspect of prototyping and talk about preparation for prototyping, so even before you start. And after that, I have a whole set of examples to call back to the points I've made to show, hopefully show you where I've made mistakes in the past so that you can learn from them. So prototyping means a lot of different things to a lot of different industries and people. It could be a formalized step of design processes and design thinking. Um, it's established in a lot of different fields. You can have paper prototyping in mobile app development or in games for that matter, or all the way up the other end, you've got enormous prototype planes that actually fly and crash and do all the kinds of things that prototype planes do. But there's a huge range of the actual prototypes you can have. So how do you define what prototyping is? And this is the uh, definition that I settled on for myself. So prototyping is an experimental process that creates a tangible experience to test a hypothesis. And the important things to take away from this is prototyping is experimental to me. It's a pro attempting new work that you may not or anyone may not have done before, and will attempt to be iterative and explorative of the problem space that you're trying to experiment in. A prototype needs to be tangible. It doesn't need to be paper to be tangible. It just means that a player must interact with it directly. Because if a prototype is not actually, if a player is not actually directly interacting with it, it could just be a presentation that says, oh, the player will go here, the player will do that. And that doesn't actually have anything more benefit besides a well thought out plan. Prototyping is also a test. It must be able to fail that test. And this comes back to the experimental aspect that I feel you need to take to heart. If you're not willing to fail when you're prototyping, you're not going to be exploring the problem space sufficiently. And lastly, you are to test a hypothesis. So you need to focus on a single question that you intend to answer so that your prototype can have value and you can actually measure its success in some way. For Polish, it's quite simple. I just stole this one from the Merriam-Webster dictionary. It's to bring to a highly developed, finished or refined state. Now, prototypes will never be finished by the definition and are very rarely going to be refined. But from my point of view, the core cool thing is prototypes should be highly developed, especially in particular areas. Now, one point that I haven't covered here is why is a prototype useful? It's a bit of a given, but the strong motivation for all prototypes is that you want to remove and mitigate uncertainty and risk. And while a plan can be made and an idea sound, the benefit comes from you knowing more about how a player, in the case of a game prototype, will react to your basic tangible form. Another thing to be noted in the prior definition is it doesn't mention speed anywhere. Because prototyping will take time and budget and will be time bound, and the amount of work you want to actually do, so your scope is almost unbound due to the nature of wanting to explore, there's a big balancing act between speed and quality. Now, when building the gameplay prototypes, developers need to work fast and explore. Improving the quality by polishing is time consuming. It's often hard to schedule, especially if the work has dependencies within the team or other teams. And more often than not, quality is the first thing that sacrifices. And what I want to focus on is making a decision between whether you focus on speed or whether you focus on quality and the benefits of both to problem space, to exploring the problem space that prototyping has. So polish. How do you identify what parts of a prototype should be of higher quality and therefore where should you focus your polishing efforts? So the next set focus on this by a series of questions that you can ask. So why? Why polish a prototype? A prototype is an investment of time and effort to remove uncertainty to the project. It's important that you actually get value and outcomes from that time invested. And there's several motivations that you can focus your polishing effort on. You can focus on enabling fast iteration so that the developers can explore the problem space more thoroughly. You can draw attention to what you are trying to test, so your hypothesis. So it draws attention to what the core um, focus of your prototype is. And lastly, you can focus on removing distractions that inhibit people seeing and testing the hypothesis. Um, for iterating faster, there's a few core systems that your prototype will be built on and identifying them and focusing on your developer's workflow for them can yield a lot of dividends almost immediately. If you can create some kind of force multiplier to how quickly your developers can work, it will your prototype will almost generally produce more, explore more, and generally have a better outcome. 
Now, this applies to designers working within game systems or artists building the supporting content. Another facet that you really shouldn't forget is you will be testing. If you are testing your hypothesis, you must be playtesting. Infrastructure that will build out your build and your playtesting ecosystem can only yield efficiencies all across the project. Now, while it's very easy to over-engineer at this point because there is a lot of scope you could build before you start your prototype, again, you do need to make a decision of speed of quality. And somewhere between you need to focus on what is important and will give you the most returns on your investment. So prototyping to draw attention to, I think I missed a slide, unfortunately. Oh no, sorry, that was developer interchange. So drawing attention. One of the most important things is you will have a process to test in your prototype. And it's important to draw import attention to what you're trying to test. Prototypes in games, they don't exist in isolation. For a to prototype a new ability, you need a game object to test that ability on, another game object to use it on, an entire game world for these two objects to exist, an input system to activate the ability, uh, so the UI to back it up, and the list goes on and on. Amongst all this infrastructure and noise, you need to just test one ability. You're trying to test the hypothesis that does this ability, is it fun to use? Um, that ability needs to stand out. You need to have the players engage with it. You need to be able to get their feedback on that ability. Um, polishing the input, the visuals, the UX of that feature, everything around it so that it stands out and it is the most rewarding part of your prototype and where the player's attention is focused will allow you to gather proper feedback on it. It's worth noticing that drawing attention to things can be detrimental to your actual objectives. A high level of polish can be distractive, especially if it's in areas that you're not necessarily testing. Uh, I did not like the color of the laser weapon will not help you establish whether or not the laser is effective. And in some cases, like the one shown here, this guy constantly running to lava, if you make it very rewarding to run into lava, they might just keep running to lava over and over again instead of actually, you know, playing the game and going to capture that imp who's sitting in the corner. So the last one to talk about is removing distractions. To get good quality play feedback from your player, you need to focus their attention on their process and you make sure they interact with it. So therefore you need to remove distractions that will draw them away from it. You remove, you remove features that are getting in the way. So they've only got maybe one ability to use or one core system for them to interact with in the prototype. Uh, you fix bugs that get in the way or you build a custom level that basically not even forces them, but encourages the use of that core ability and that core hypothesis that you're trying to test. So one technique for this is to reduce the rest of the game down. So in this example, the environment is pretty low poly. There's not a lot here to see, but there is some important aspects. There are still heavily focused on the directions you can move. Do you can go underground here? If people, if we're trying to test that we wanted people to use the underground passage in our map, this is one way you can encourage them to go that direction. However, you do run the risk that the rest of the game that you have stripped away in the effort of highlighting this uh, particular ability that you're trying to test will give you a false result because you're testing in isolation. So at some point you need to balance the whole game versus your focus. So the next point is once you decide out why you're going to polish, when do you do it? When in your production schedule of your prototype should you start your polishing? And there's no hard or fast rules here, but depending on your motivation for why you wanted to add the polish will dictate when it's the most appropriate to do it. In the case of enabling iteration, the answer is always as early as possible. If you can do it before you start, if you can do it with a few people before the majority of the team come into the prototype and the environment, that would be best. Distractions, however, and drawing people attention do not come online until much later in the prototyping's life cycle. In the case of drawing attention, your feature is probably available early on in the project, but over time, there will be more distractions, it will lose focus, so you'll need to constantly uh, work on your polish that will draw attention to what is important. Whereas removing distractions, they will come along as you progress. And one thing to note, probably not worth preemptively pre removing distractions, because you don't know there'll be distractions. They may even add to the experience by the time you finally get there. So the last point is, coming back to your process, is what do you need to prove? And this is probably the most important question to ask, and it comes back to the objectives that you're trying to achieve. It's essential you know what you want to prove so you can effectively polish to improve your to improve the chance of your success of proving it. So when I've been prototyping in games, 
iteration hypothesis, they generally fall into three broad categories. I'm either trying to prove out a technical system. So for a technical feature, it's usually straightforward to define what you need to be proved. In my experience, it's always worth asking a few questions that basically come back to the core processing, which is reducing uncertainty. So I usually look at this in three angles. So is it is it possible? Does the functionality even exist out there? There might be a prior example, you might not know about it, but does will a technique even work? Is it performant? And at what scale is important? This is important because in a, low, a small scale game, a feature might be very possible. When you scale it up to a massive multiplayer game with thousands of people, it's of course gonna be a very different kind of feature. And lastly, is the feature, the technical feature that you're building flexible enough for your needs? Because you may need to prototype a system to help production. It doesn't necessarily need to be a gameplay feature. This could actually be for developers who are going to use it in pre-production and beyond. And one thing to really focus on is the parameters that which you design this technical system for, you need to make sure they're right. Because if someone asks you for 100 units on screen and then they really want 1,000, that's going to be very different. And your prototype will approve the wrong point in the, under the wrong scenarios. One of the easy, next easiest thing to probably define is a gameplay feature. This is a single mechanic or loop. Um, it's usually easy to, easy to find, but it's very hard to create a meaningful hypothesis. For gameplay features, I find it's better to focus on the response you wish to invoke from the player. So do you want to invoke a sense of pressure, or relaxation, accomplishment, or fun? But even the last one becomes a little bit hard to test, truly. Are people having fun? You can ask them directly, and it may be, but is it that ability, or is it the environment in which you tested it? So while it may be easy to find what you're testing, finding an hypothesis is actually going to give you a result to go forward and reduce your uncertainty can be quite hard for a single gameplay feature. Then lastly, there's a player experience. And it's very similar to the gameplay feature in idea, but it mainly differs in scope and the concept that you can't really test it in isolation. So as opposed to a single ability, examples would be like art styles. Does this art style work? Is this art style relaxing? Is this art style atmospheric? If you're in a horror game, you really need to drum down the pressure that your environment art will create. And the big question to ask is, is it core to the experience? Because while many systems will be needed to test a player experience, probably not all of them are required. So the last question to ask yourself when you're planning on what to polish in a prototype is who is the audience? Because it's very important who you're trying to prove your hypothesis for. They need to be at the foremost of your mind, this audience, because they are the source of the uncertainty around the objective of the project. You are trying to mitigate uncertainty in a player base, a team, a studio, someone. And if it's not the players, because you can't release a prototype to your players, well, you can, but that's called early access. But within reason, a prototype is probably well before you could even release it to your players. So more often than not, the first place is probably you and your team. In this case, you're directing, you are interacting with them directly. So you can probably ease off on a lot of polish because you can smooth over bugs and make the experience to get into multiplayer very graceful and easy. Um, their needs as a player and how they represent your final audience may be very close or it may be hard to understand. You may have a very a team who is very hardcore players or you may have a team who's very hardcore developers. Their skills and difference and competencies in the game may differ wildly. Knowing them and tailoring your prototype for them and your hypothesis for them is important. The next step might be your studio. You need to prove an idea to the greater studio to get buy-in from the team who will eventually be building this project should it go live. And you potentially learn on a journey. Including them in the project will be likely. They can probably be given briefs. They can probably be included. But you probably will need to deal with them offline. You will not talk to them directly. You'll present them with play tests. You'll have a limited amount of time to present to them and gather their information. And this will affect what you polish because it may be more important for you to polish the gameplay, sorry, the game test experience as opposed to the actual gameplay itself. And then lastly is people external to the students. These are external stakeholders like publishers or UX test players once you are at a certain sophisticated level. What do you know about them? What kind of games do they like? What do they play? Why do you need support? What information do you want back for them? What, how will they feedback to help you prove your process? What feedback are you going to gather from them? Now, in this case, you have the least frequency and ability to interact with them. Though so tutorials might be necessary at this point or some kind of destructions in game. 
Generally speaking, as the number of potential players gets further away from you, their number increases, the more valuable polish in the experience, their first experience and displaying the objectives of the prototype become. So what I find the most important aspect of prototyping is preparing for it, because prototyping is exercise of preparing in something larger. It's not the time to skip preparation. In many ways, it's definitely the first piece of polish you put into your prototype. And while you could just jump in and get something ready in hours, in my experience, it is highly effective to step back and put effort into the preparation and bring polish to your process of prototyping. So focus on the hypothesis. What do you need to prove and who do you need to prove it to? You really need to make sure that you are aligned with your team, your studio or the external stakeholders with what you are trying to prove. If two people think this prototype is proving different things, you're gonna get a very mismatched feedback on what you're actually trying to achieve. Generally speaking, I try to avoid general searching. I find that defeats the purpose of having a Python if you just wanna find the fun or bottle the lightning or you know create some magic that will enhance players. It's not focused, it's not iterative. It, it can work, but I find it will be very inefficient time spent. Now, once you know what you're going to do, you've got your hypothesis, you're pretty confident about what you're trying to prove, you need to start with an engine. There are lots of options out there. You can start with a propriety engine. It comes with a lot of benefits. There are specialized development environments designed to deliver specific types of games. If you have access to one, there's a strong chance your team has a lot of expertise in that engine. However, depending on your objective, it may not be cost effective to modify this engine because it tends to be very specialized or to iterate it into and pull it into another direction. Unreal and Unity are the two most popular third party engines and they come with their own strengths and weaknesses. However, they are very popular. And again, you have the likelihood that your developers will have some experience in one or the other, or at least in that uh, editor focused uh, development environment. They do require some expertise, but there is a lot of support on this and there's a good chance your developers start somewhere. Um, but they're not specialized, so you'll probably need to put more effort into making the general third-party engine suit your needs. And then lastly, there are third-party engines. They will have, there's so much, so many of them out there. They all have their strengths and weaknesses. They all have specializations that may suit your prototype very well. There are some very powerful 2D uh, game engines out there that are perfect for making pixel perfect prototypes. And if that is what you're after, then one of those engines would probably be the best choice for you, even though it may be hard to find developers who have particular skills in that field. Now, as you're trying to prepare, you are trying to reduce uncertainty. The method revised to get there is your developers need to be confident. They need to have, un they need to not be, sorry, they need to be certain in what they're doing. To reduce the uncertainty, they need to be certain. And proficiency with what they are doing and how they're working in their environment will make you move faster. It is the If you prepare here, this is the fastest way to improve your iteration time and ability to explore a problem space, is to be competent in your tools, to have your tools set up efficiently, ready to go, so they know the engine, they have their content pipelines, they have all the tools supported for it, and they have a build infrastructure and a playtest infrastructure for them to test. In that environment, if, that is, if you've done your preparation and set that up for your developers, they will hit the ground running and you will see results and builds within days. Now, once you've selected an engine, the next thing to do is to build on the work of others or yourself. Existing content from another game is a great source of assets. They can't, it can come with functional systems. Using a game engine comes with tutorials and basic building blocks for networking, pathfinding, all these systems that you can use. Um, it's impossible to match how hardened these systems are for their dedicated purposes. So if you don't need to change a particular aspect of it, this is a very strong tool for prototyping. You use the existing content to give you a leg up. Now, there's obvious drawbacks. You need access to the engine and its content and the engine and or content needs to match your prototype. Now, there are also some subtle drawbacks that are worth calling out here is generally games that ship, certain low poly uh, visuals aside, will have a very high level of polish. So if you change anything, it'll be immediately obvious that you've changed it and will draw attention to it. Now, debug text might be something that's drawn attention, but it's still very hard to read against a wonderful background that is uh, full 
1080p and wonderful god rays and lighting and smoke and all the other trimmings that comes with it, it can be breaking to the experience and it may not be the best way to focus on your hypothesis. Another subtle consequence of using another game engine or its content is that these assets will come with expectations. If your target audience is familiar with the content, it can have a negative impact on successfully getting them to engage with your new concept that you're trying to prototype. For example, in the past, we've used existing content from World of Tanks in a new way, and this changed the speed or capabilities of a unit. We often got feedback from the people that was so toast, tightly uh, tied to the original asset. They knew this tank, and basically the feedback would say, this tank is too fast. Regardless of its relative speeds within its prototype, they felt that the tank they could saw was driving faster than seen it in a real game. Or gameplay-wise, they shot the tank in the tread and they expected it to be stopped, which is a core gameplay feature of World of Tanks. You have the asset, they see the asset, they expect to shoot in a particular location and get a gameplay outcome. If your prototype does not meet that expectation, that is one of the pieces of feedback they'll focus on as opposed to your prototype. Conversely, in another prototype, we tried to break the association with tanks that we're using by looking, using very generic looking vehicles that were in simplistic form. However, in this case, we went way too far. And we see feedback focused on the visual of the unit and not necessarily on its capabilities. We wanted to test gameplay here and all we got feedback on was this hover tank was too floaty. It's a hover tank, it's meant to float, but that was obviously not what they wanted. They wanted a tank, they didn't want something that floated. In this case, they expect them to be heavy vehicles of destruction and we missed our mark. So knowing you what your audience expects and choosing the gameplay and content that will fall into the background of your experience is something you should prepare for. And lastly, oh, not even lastly, sorry, storeboard assets. The next step in this tier is that you can buy assets for almost all the engines I mentioned out there. Um, you can buy general uh, art assets or general audio assets that work in any engine, even propriety ones with a little bit of importing, or most of the Unity and Unreal uh, have both have stores and you can get a lot of content that you can pull straight into your game. Again, there are drawbacks and pros and cons here. They will be of various quality and style. So the style might not match what you're trying to go for. The quality might not be up to scratch. They may take time to learn and use effectively. And in general, they cost money. And if they don't cost money, they probably cost time to tailor to your needs. But still, great leg up, leg up to get started. Here are two examples that I've used in a few of my prototypes you'll see now. They're great. I picked them up from the Unreal Store. There's a nice stylized forest. And there's these nice little robots and tanks that you can build and chop and change and do anything you want. So the other source of content to give you a leg up is your previous prototypes. If you will be doing prototyping and building games, there's a chance you have a repository of previous prototypes that you can leverage to uh, prepare for the next prototype. Uh, in this case, I reused the input, the model, and the animations from one prototype to the next. It gave me a nice polished network movement model. Even though the characters and the game are very different, I was reusing the legs, got it in your body, Everything else was the same, and I started with a model that could run around a map, look pretty decent from day one. So that's basically what I think about prototyping, the questions to ask about why you're doing it, and the preparation. After that comes the actual making the prototype. This I can't help you with because it will be your prototype you will have a different hypothesis, you'll have different work. What I can give you is a whole bunch of uh, practical examples of where I've made mistakes, and hopefully you can learn from them. So the first set of ones I'm gonna look at are the technical prototypes. So in a recent concept, um, this is actually barely a prototype, but it does highlight several of the principles involved, is one of the projects we're using had a new piece of technology with Unreal for our game objects. And a request from Art came in to support multiple UV channels for rendering. This is a pretty standard feature that you'd expect. However, the new technology TechStack we're using did not support this feature. So this is one of the first technical things is, is it even possible? And from the basic API, it was not. Now, building a concrete system to support this would have taken the time of several developers, several sprints to actually get a finished asset into engine. And while diving in, we probably would have reached the same conclusion eventually, there was a lot of uncertainty around this about should we even invest. So for this technical prototype, we focus on getting the minimum functionality to remove the uncertainty and it additionally paid off. So basically what I did, got a quad, used the same tech stack that we wanted, 
put two UVs on it. With a very short amount of effort, we totally removed the uncertainty involved and uh, proved that the tech could be done, which basically made the decision easy to put the two teams to actually upgrade the proper feature to support two, U two UVs. Uh, technical po polish and prototyping is often needed in more ambitious prototypes, especially when you're making an entirely new system or to remove a distraction. Um, it's also possible to approach this as a technical prototype and basically polish one part of your prototype to remove the distractions so that they stop worrying about the technical problems they're facing and, wor and pay attention to the game and how they enjoy it. So in one prototype, our server would start losing performance once the unit came in the count got in the game to be about a few hundred. Now this was really concerning because the original spec wanted there to be 500 or so units on the, in the game at any one point. Now the performance was impacting gameplay and it was very hard for people to enjoy the experience because basically once it ground to a halt, no one could actually play. Now the server was CPU bound, but not for traditional it was basically the networking cost of sending these hundreds of units all across the thing and the cost to calculate what had changed and send it out uh, was too expensive and the server uh, CPU just tanked. Um, we looked at making this more efficient, but basically the performance improvements in there were going nowhere. So decision was made to try and prototype something new. And the core part of this solution was in this game, every, each individual unit belonged to a logical squad. And the hypothesis to test was simple. If only the squads were replicated and networked, would the player still enjoy the experience? He no longer has individual soldiers being replicated. He has squads. Um, so that was the hypothesis we're trying to test. So the individuals were removed from the networking model. Their behavior was made mostly deterministic on the clients and the squads became the only networked object. In this case, the gameplay did not change as far as the players was concerned. The decision making was already already at the squad level and the performance for the server shot right up. So we went from not being able to support about 300 to being able to support about 2000 on screen at one time. And this was even in a prototype with everything else pretty much unoptimized. And basically after that point, people started to focus on the gameplay that was involved with these squads and squad combat. Another part to polish is for expectations really wanted to meet players' expectations so that removing the distraction of what they expect in a, well, AAA game is, ex is experienced in your very tiny, crappily made two-week prototype. So modern games have been refining this to a perfect art of how to shoot another vehicle or another person. It's, they've spent years on this, and your prototype is going to have to deal with the fact that all these, this fidelity of gameplay is expected. Um, if you can't provide a basic level of shooting experience, you will suffer. So the first one is precision aiming. In a lot of games, the ability to shoot your other target is seamless. The amount of engineering involved is not. Um, the first time we learned this was I was building a prototype. Um, at Wargaming Sydney, we have a program that we use to have personally directed uh, work that fosters innovation. And one of these events is called Hack Ops, where you f form small teams and you build whatever you want over a few days. In one of the recent Hack Ops, I neglected to see the importance of including a precision aim mode. So think sniper mode or look down, aim down sights. Um, basically, because I was play testing this constantly, I was getting pretty good at it. And in a few days I had the skills to not need it. However, throwing it at my new players who had never seen this before, even if I could be standing right next to them and they were part of my team and they would know about it, uh, they found it very hard to actually engage with the prototype because I couldn't hit anything. So don't underestimate what a core gameplay feature has been unnecessary is if they really need it to actually play the game. And you are probably not the best person to actually make that evaluation. It's always best to have someone else probably have a go first and tell you, is it important? So the second half of the problem comes under the default settings of most third-party engines, is that the mouse input to camera movement is very linear. And there is a minimum distance your camera can actually move in pixels when you move the mouse. Until unless you point, even if you point your mouse up to massive uh, fidelity, um, you're still gonna move your mouse one pixel, which is gonna translate to an angle of your gun, which may in your game at long ranges translate to multiple pixels or multiple uh, world units. 
Um, in this particular game, the point was to hit very small targets from a very long way away, and you can't do it. If that small target happens to fit between two pixels in your mouse input, you cannot actually hit it. So one small trick that uh, I learned is that you can put a small amount of input scaling, which is this graph on the right, which means very small mouse movements result in very small camera movements. And it will basically make you be able to hit tiny objects when you're moving the mouse at a very small amount, as well as if you whip the mouse around, still have full movement of your vehicle. Um, now there is a bit of balancing because it can be annoying if people expect it to be a bit linear. I know in some games it is hard, but the ability to make fine shots was important in this prototype and that's what I chose to polish. And it worked out well once I got the sniper mode in. Uh, it's also worth noticing that if you put some form of input scaling on your turning, this is great for your network model in general because adding delays at the high end of spectrating as you're rotating will make it easy if you actually send delayed messages across the network so that the player facing turrets, which are present in all the vehicles you can see, move smoothly on, other, on observing clients. Uh, auto aim, this is another part of uh, modern shooters uh, that you can't necessarily ignore. Uh, it's slightly highly contentious, especially on the competitive scene about how much auto aim you need. And in some titles, the auto aim is distracting to the point that people will go to forums and complain loudly about it. However, in many cases, if you are not trying to prove something new about the shooting experience, you may not need to have a um, precision shooting. You could have very forgiving auto aiming and your players would love you for it because all they wanted to do was shoot something. Uh, in this particular prototype, um, we just got rid of shooting altogether. Uh, this was to test something that was about slow and competitive uh, combat, slow tactical combat, sorry. So to move away from Twitch and see how, if you, how you felt about winning based on your brains. And so we ripped out the uh, shooting altogether. And basically, the longer that target was in your under your reticle, uh, your shot would slowly come to be perfectly accurate. So it was more about basically pointing your vehicle in the right direction and or blinking away to safety. Um, now, it's worth noting in this prototype that it failed, the prototype failed. It's not that the hypothesis was false, it wasn't that people didn't like the tactical gameplay, it's that at the end of the work, we couldn't actually answer our hypothesis. Now, the reason was because we didn't play to our strengths, and particularly on the networking and proficiencies. Too much of the team had not actually dealt with networking multiplayer games, and when we got to it, a single networking bug meant too much time was spent fixing this one bug. And at the end of the day, we could not actually deliver it in time. So it comes back to the point is your hypothesis is allowed to be false, but you need to try very hard to make sure that you don't waste time on your prototype. Because I would still love to know if tactical slow combat was fun, but I haven't quite got there yet. Now, another one that you can't necessarily ship with, but it's great for... Uh, online prototypes is client-side authority in your networking model. Now, at Wargaming, we have studios everywhere in the world. So even before the pandemic, we were playing with people that could be on the other side of the planet in pings of upwards of 500 milliseconds. Um, and if you are prototyping with them and your stakeholder happens to be in another country, it is great to play with them. It is great to have personal contact during the play test. You see how they play, you see what they struggle with, you get their feedback directly, which is a great boon to your prototyping experience. It is very hard to technically solve this, but you can cheat. So in this case, you use client-side authoritative weapons. So these weapons will actually, if you shoot them and they hit on your screen, regardless of the lag to the server or the other players, uh, we will pay that shot. And even in a weapon that you can see highlighted here, um, that weapon, that, that line is only on the screen for about, you know, I think it's 200 milliseconds. But if that hit on your screen, it was incredibly obvious to players that they'd hit someone else. And if the server was to reject that shot, they hated it. So we had a vehicle that had one of these weapons on it and people wouldn't play it because under any, even the smallest amount of latency, the weapon would hit on their screen, they would not receive their damage response and that would be the feedback we would receive from them. And in that endeavor, the answer was client side authority. It, for laser weapons and only laser weapons, uh, we allowed them to be client-side authoritative, which gave them a good experience. And it means they stopped focusing on 
oh man, I got ripped off in my shot to do I like this vehicle? Do I like this game mode? Do I like how this entire prototype plays? Now, the implementation is really dependent on your engine, but the principle is simple. Generally speaking, you send a message to the server that the client has shot. In this case, perform the shot on the client. Client determines whether they've hit the target, and then you just send the damage message. And the biggest thing to inform, remember, this must be temporary. It's cheating. You cannot ship a product without this to have any kind of security model intact. And the sooner you move to a proper networking model means the sooner you can start improving that player experience, which comes back to it. Because if they felt robbed off in your prototype, they're going to feel robbed in your main game. So if you can't solve that well enough in the main game, you're going to have the same problem that we had in the prototype. Iteration. So this is coming back to allowing your developers to iterate faster. So on one of our prototypes, we identified a core aspect of it was we planned a huge diversity in volumes of weapons. All our units, we wanted to have lots of weapons on them, lots of different ways to shoot each other. And in a multiplayer game, how we networked them, CCSA, was very important. So we invested in a weapon system that could handle a whole bunch of this uh, flexibility be very easy for the designers to iterate, pretty easy for artists to tap into, and basically inspect. So we didn't spend too much time debugging it and wasting time with the networking. So this was the area we chose to polish. Um, basically, as a flexible data-driven via cycle, every weapon we had from a Gatling gun to a flamethrower to a homing missile to lasers to whatever else you can imagine goes through these four cycles. So it goes ready, prepare, release, recover. Um, basically, it allowed for maximum flexibility. They, designers could data drive whatever they wanted out of this, and we, I literally gave them, I think, a laser and a gun, and we ended up with 24 different weapons. I can't show any of these to you, which is unfortunate, but I'll just there's the quote from the designer down there. He basically put five different guns on a unit, and it just worked, and it was awesome. Um, now, this investment in the system was well worth it, and the thing to note is it has paid us back prototype on prototype. Now, we did make one mistake here is that in one of the prototypes that we used it, we tightly coupled it to a technology that was not standard. And that was a mistake. In this case, this weapon system was great. It was very easy to drop in. It was very easy to use. But by tying to a uh, technology, it meant that other systems, other prototypes could not use it. So we missed several opportunities for people to use it, to give them a boost up in their prototypes. So we had to spend the dev cost to actually ramp out that, those improvements and go back to the original weapon system. Now, since it's been cleaned up, it has been dropped into another prototype by another team. So the person who even benefited from this was not me and was not my team. So it's worth noticing that investing in the right thing and investing in it properly is worth it. Because remember, if you do this right and you prototype something successful, it may be an entire dev cycle before you get back to prototyping because you're gonna take something to market. So the next person who sees your code is gonna be you and you are not going to remember how it worked. So investing in a little bit of documentation and a little bit of polish on your systems will pay off. And especially if you can share it, because that just helps everybody out. Ah, so uh, as part of innovation time that I talked about, uh, myself and several members of my team, we submitted an entry to Unreal Mega Jam last year. And we called this game called Imprison, which is this wonderful little imp who runs around a grid. Well, actually, you're the person who jumps in lava, but you're meant to be catching that imp. Um, it was chaotic. It was a cooperative. And one of the decisions we made that was very beneficial was we built it on a grid. And we did that from day one. And basically, this was the thing we polished early on, is we polished the grid. We had a few prototypes. Uh, it's not even prototypes. Prototypes of gameplay, like the very first versions. The grid was rough. It was not well-developed. Bugs were everywhere, and it was very hard to work. So... We focused on it, we polished it. The grid system is used for everything. It's used for casting spells, pathfinding, decision-making, constantly expanding lava pits, dragons, and cages, and all the other things. It all used the same system, and it was robust. It also meant that if anything was broken, we changed one part in one, in one system, and you fixed the whole game. This is just one of the things that if you identify a core feature that you want and you fix it, you can make your iteration faster. Because half those features I said at the end would not have made it if we did not have the grid system in at the start. Now, atmosphere. Atmosphere can make a lot 
to a game experience and the lack of it can really kill the vibe. So one of the earliest and most well-loved hack operators we built on was just a foot race. So you're running around this map. However, we really wanted it to have a lot of players there, but our networking chops, this is like literally the first time I'd ever used Unreal was not there. We didn't know how to make a 100 person, 200 person game, let alone have enough people or a server well enough to have it. So what we did was we add bots. And it is way more exciting to be running with even these really boring regular bots who run on perfect angles every time and turn almost in sync at the same point um, to give you this feeling and atmosphere that you are running in a group. Now, this isn't the original prototype. I had to remake this. But the bots I'm talking about here took me less than an hour to make when I remade this video. So it's that amount of effort to polish can totally give you the atmosphere that you could not achieve in a prototype otherwise. Juice. Juice is a wonderful thing. I drink it every morning. I prefer orange juice. Can't stand grapefruit juice. But no, what I'm actually talking about is from one of my favorite talks of, it's not even recent anymore. I think it was almost a decade ago. Um, but it's called Juice It or Lose It by these guys. Martin, I will not pronounce the names in case I get them wrong, but those two gentlemen. And they basically did a very wonderful interactive talk about how a small amount of polish can make a game come alive. Now, all these techniques are very important tools in prototyping for drawing attention to what's important or in many ways, making the core loop that you're trying to prove rewarding. Because it may be that you have a decent mechanic, but without enough feedback and input that that mechanic will not resonate with a player. In many cases, everything you do in modern games is juiced up and players have gotten used to that. So something that is plain and without animation, without feedback, without juice will fall to the wayside. So it may be a necessary part of polish to bring it up to people's standards and make things. And generally, juice is really win-win because it is quick and it's impactful and players love it. If you get the time, you can go and find their talk on YouTube. I highly recommend it. So polishing the core, where do you add your juice? You add juice to what the player does every second of every minute of the game. Um, Basically, for a Ludum Dare recently, I was building a submarine. It was boring. It did nothing. It floated around and shot bubbles. It doesn't do much. Uh, I was getting bored. I was getting real bored playtesting this. You, I've played through this exact level with these little jellyfish 40, 50 times. Adding juice actually improved my motivation on this game. So adding those little bubbles, adding that little spinning wheel, um, adding the death bubbles to the guys shooting it, that added the reward, added the feedback to the loop that what I was doing was good and I was winning. And it basically made playtesting this way more bearable. So the, the project went away. And I love that part. I do love the way they all spin and rise to the top of the water. I'm very proud of that. So in a similar vein, making a novel feature that you want people to engage with feel good is going to increase the rate that people engage with it. So I saw this very early in basically um, covering up a slow drop into lava being satisfying. It was too satisfying. They just wanted to dive in there and hear their wonderful sound of effect that they'd made about this little guy going poof. Um, but it also was pretty effective for this ball movement sprint mode that we developed for this game. Basically, to hide the terrible animations that were going on, simply adding a little hop, a tiny little bit of bounce into this made it rewarding. And it gave you feedback on the thing. And people went from not using it at all, because they didn't understand what happened when they just turned into a ball, to it propelling you in a direction, giving you this speed boost as you entered it, that it was natural and became a core part of the prototype. Now, I tried a lot of ways to actually make the rolling look good, but I was on a high, very time constrained thing. I had absolutely no artists in this project. Now, it actually turns out that having a completely matte gray ball looked better than texturing and having it rolling because the rolling looked unnatural and it was a detraction. It basically looked wrong. If you were to do this properly, you would have the rolling, but you would smooth it. There would be motion blur on it. There'd probably be sprint lines on it, and that would make it good. But without the effort to put in all the effort, all time and visual polish, simply making it a gray ball and using the fact that the grass is rushing ahead of it and blurring the bottom of it, basically made it a good, solid experience. Very little effort. And if you compare this to any real game, it's going to be terrible. But in the scope of this prototype, people engaged with this mode and used it to pretty heavily to move around. And then the last one, you'll see it all over the place. I think it's also one of the most effective is damage numbers. 
people complain about them all the time. It ruins immersion or whatever, but there is no better way to give feedback to the player that they did something right than showing a big number in their face that it was awesome. Um, and in your prototype, you're desperate to give them feedback about what they're doing because you do not have all the polish of a game that will do it seamlessly. Now, on the left, you can see what the actual World of Tanks one is. This is a highly streamlined game. It cares about its aesthetics. It cares about its immersion. The damage number is optional. It's controlled through settings. It's a tiny number next to the nameplate. If you're not paying attention, you will miss it. That's not the answer for a prototype. You really want to tell them they hit that target because you may not have the explosion. You may not have the smoke. You may not have that really satisfying chink of the noise of when you hit damage or you ricochet. All that might be missing your prototyping. What you do have is a massive number that says you did 1250 damage. And I'm pretty sure people are going to like that. It's a bit excessive, but it gets the point across. And that brings us to the end of the talk. I hoped you enjoyed about how I think about why you should polish a prototype and hopefully you took away some uh, techniques to use in the future. And I will leave you with a quote which I found while researching this that I think just made me smile. So if a picture is worth a thousand words, then a prototype is worth a thousand meetings. But I still haven't figured out if it's more meetings or less meetings, than, but anyway. Thank you. So back to you, Paul. Thank you very much for that, Luke. Okay, if I can get you to put your camera big so that we can see you again. Um, if anyone has any questions, drop them into the chat. Um, Luke won't be able to see them, but I will be able to pass them on for you. Now, in the meantime, I've got a question for you. So mm -hmm. has there been any time in the past where, and this is kind of a two-part question, um, either you've put in, you've put some polish onto a prototype and it paid huge dividends or the opposite, where you maybe thought, oh, we don't need to put any polish on this particular bit here. And then afterwards you're like, damn it, why didn't we do that? So I did say this one. I still think the biggest one I'm kicking myself over was the aiming. Like not putting in a proper sniper mode for a game all about shooting small things um, just killed it. <laughs> Basically, that feature did absolutely nothing. No one could advance it. We had very cool things hidden behind gates requiring you to shoot small stuff, and it didn't work. So that's still probably the one. Um, put the most effort in and got not allowed out, not a lot out of it. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. So I suppose it's the ones where it's invaluable. So in that one where we had 2,000 units on screen, we put an awful amount of work into um, preventing loaded soldiers from getting lost. Um, now, we did fix it, and we don't know if people noticed, um, because in theory it was a distraction. Now, the big question is, was it worth us removing that tiny distraction for the amount of work? And that's the part where I think we may have actually lost on that front is we spent so much engineering fixing that and so many techniques and tests and prototypes to try and get around some limitations of the engine we're working in, all to keep one guy with his squad. At the end of the day, I think people just got a little upset when they failed to realize they left a guy behind, um, but that was it. Okay. I'm actually gonna switch on my light. It's a little yep, dark. Go for it. And I'm just gonna very, Quickly adjust Luke's camera so he's a little bit more in the middle. Because we were, we unfortunately were missing a little bit of your head then. There we go. And you get two of me as well. Who doesn't want that? Um, The joys of using Teams. So I do have a question for you from Alex. Can prototyping be used as a business case? I.e. we need a networking specialist on the team to work on the prototype. Uh, definitely. If you, I mean, your prototype is your investment in your future. If you are, if you need to prove networking capabilities as part of your prototype, if they are important for it, um, then getting that person in on board to de-risk the technical challenges you will face are important, are very important. Like you will fail. I will counter that. If you are doing a very standard network-based game, maybe not, because that's not key to your hypothesis. It all depends on what you're trying to achieve with your prototypes. Hmm, interesting way of looking at it. Um, 
let's just see if we have any other questions. I don't see any other questions at the moment. So, um, yeah, if you do have any, please pop them into the chat and I'll be able to pass them on. Um, so the the one where you didn't use the aiming, that was that was a hack ops project, wasn't it? That was a hack ops project. So James was on that project as well. Yes, yeah, so we have someone in the chat who worked on that as well. So just for everyone's benefit, because they might be wondering what on earth a hack ops is, do you want to just quickly tell people what that is? Right, yeah, so I touched on this a little bit. So hack ops is a one of the innovation initiatives at Wargaming Sydney. Uh, where you, basically we take two to three days off as a whole studio and you form up teams and all of you will work on whatever a project of your desire. There will be a theme to guide you, um, but at the end of the day, you will have built something and there will be prizes in lots of different categories. There's lots of different ways to win, um, but you're basically trying to make something cool. Investigate new technology, meet with all your other developers you may not see. And that's the Hack Ops, one of the great things. You usually get a cool shirt. Not this one, but something like this. No, this this shirt was for something else. But we we normally, and in fact, James, who is in the chat, who was the person the quote was from earlier, is one of the designers of a lot of the t-shirts we get for Hack Ops. He's, he's probably our most um, prolific t-shirt designer. Um, I'll have a quick look at the chat. Um... That, that same person, James, that very cheeky one, he has said, is multiplayer worth it? Or yes. worth prototyping anyway? Yes. Uh, this is actually a little bit interesting. And it comes back to the question that Alex asked about, do you need your network engineer early? If you are trying to prototype a multiplayer experience, you can't really prototype it with bots. The bots can add atmosphere. The bots can add sophistication, but if the goal is to play against another player in a competitive fashion, it is very hard to justify not using multiplayer. Now, if you're on a short-term project and you want to make something that is fun and can totally be played single player, then maybe. But if your intention is to see how the cooperation and interactions between players add to your game experience, I reckon the multiplayer has to be there from the start. Sounds good. Um, Alex, yes, basically Hack Ops is our in-house game jam. So we, it's, it's very, very similar to how a game jam is. We run it over a couple of days. We get pizza and stuff in when we do it in the studio. The last few have been virtual because of COVID, obviously, but they're a lot of fun. Um, okay, regarding client side authority, I understand it can guarantee the shooter's satisfaction, but what about the receiving end? I mean, the victim can be trying just as hard to dodge the shot, right? Yes. So uh, you're coming into the psychology of the problem is most people feel uh, more ripped off when they miss a shot. The reason is they are actively engaged with it. If a player is able to actively engage in dodging, they will feel very ripped off by this and that will be a negative experience. Client-side authority, of course, cannot actually be resolved because what the client sees will be different to what the server has in store. So in a lot of games, this is not true, especially if you're first person. So I'll say this, if you're a first person shooter, it is very hard for a first person player to have um, self-awareness of where their body is. So unless the, the resolution of the shot on the observing client is particularly egregious, uh, it will be just accepted. The worst case you'll see this is in some first person shooters, you as a player will have run around a corner and you feel you would have got into uh, cover and a networking model that favors a shooter will have you die around the corner. And it doesn't feel great, I appreciate this, but in the grand scheme of things, if I was a shooter and I saw I hit a guy enough to kill him and they did not die, I would feel more robbed and therefore less engaged with the product. But when you pull this into third person, it gets very tricky because often in third person, you are engaged with your uh, avatar. You can see them. You can see their full extents. You will be able to see the traces of weapons used against you. And if they're clearly not missing you and they're highly visual lasers that are, you know, the size of your vehicle and they just miss by five meters and you still die, you will feel robbed, especially if you have the ability to defend against it through uh, any kind of invincibility action or any kind of shield action, etc. heal. Take your pick. Um, there is no magnificent, graceful solution to that. You will need to hide it with trickery and network uh, wind-ups, 
to try and alleviate this problem. Uh, if you want a great talk on this, it goes really high into the nitty gritties. There is a talk by David Aldridge from Reach, and it talks about armor lock, which was an invincibility ability. Uh, the networking around that to make a player activating this ability that makes them invulnerable, and they're heavily invested in this, and not having them robbed is a very, very interesting problem that they came up with a solution for. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, quick question. Have you ever had a case where you're working on a prototype and you know it needs to get a little bit of polish just to, to bring some things out, but the team differs on where they think the polish should go? How do you, how do you decide what is the most important thing that you need to put that polish onto? That is a very interesting question. Um, the right answer is everything. But of course, that's not going to fly because you are time constrained. Um, so prototyping is an interesting problem because it um, it is not traditional uh, software development. Most of the software processes you have work about being in a, a complex environment. So it is basically there are more unknowns than there are unknowns. Prototyping is definitely off into the chaotic area where there is far less known and predictable than there is known anything about it because you have no idea what the effect is. In many cases, it is best to have polish something rather than nothing. So in many cases, trust your developers. They are players too, they care, but you will need to just choose one of the things among the plethora, maybe even just take a vote. If everyone is equally engaged in your project, you trust them as players, let them choose the order of these areas of uh, product, uh, polish. Okay, cool. Adam, can you talk a little bit about what the makeup of a prototyping team would usually be? Like in your experience when you've worked on prototypes in the, in the past? Uh, it is entirely dependent on your prototype. So I've worked on tech prototypes, which the, uh, the UV channel came from, and that was multiple engineers and tech artists and barely a designer, um, because frankly, it was de-risking very complicated tech. Um, that is a very different prototype to an entire game mode prototype, which in many cases, you do need a few engineering because if you're talking about a game mode, you're talking about a whole experience. In this case, it would be multiplayer. You will definitely need a lot of engineers to make sure your multiplayer and networking model is up to scratch. You will need artists and designers involved. Um, and that is different to just content because you can also do in content. And in general, I'd say content is one in the spectrum. You probably need less engineering depending on how complicated your systems are. Um, and also how uh, complex and chaotic your systems are. If your systems are very well known, you can come back to begin a bootleg off existing engines. If you know you're just making a first person shooter, your need for an engineer in those environments is very low. The first person uh, modules, plugins, and everything that come with Unreal and Unity can get you 90% of the way you need. So you probably need little engineering in that case, a lot of design, a lot of art. But it really heavily depends on what you're trying to achieve. Okay, cool. Um, I think oh, we do have another question. Ooh, this is an interesting one. Do you think your background in robotics has helped you in your career in video games? Uh, so ironically, yes, it has. Um, well, A, I learned how to do an A-star algorithm while doing robotics back in the 90s. Um, but I did my master's thesis on computer vision on something called scale invariant feature transforms, which is a very boring mathematical computer vision thing. However, that is the technology that underpins all AR technology today. So when I did the AR technology, I was like, oh, yeah, I helped write this 20 years later. So the background in that helped me a lot with pathfinding because pathfinding and navigation has been mathematically explored well before robotics or games have got to it. So there is a lot of very strong theory that is out there that's just not practical for games. And as hardware and sophistication of the computer languages improves and grows and doubles every N years, whatever it is now, uh, more and more of the theory comes online. So something you work on now that's purely theoretical or learn at university could totally be the core technology in 20 years time. So you mentioned the AR. I don't think many people will know what that is. Can you just can... say a little bit about it and maybe I will how you went about prototyping you. that? 
the video because that will t it's way better to show this than anything else. Uh, but just grab a link. I have seen I've seen the AR in work and it's very very yes. cool. So this is the official release video. I will throw that to you, Paul, and you can find a way to get it to the stream. I can do that. That's up on YouTube. Uh, so. World of Tanks AR was to take uh, the World of Tanks engine, which is a very pretty engine, and spent a lot of time, proprietary engine, spent a lot of time building the graphics on it to visually render tanks at incredibly high resolutions, including things like tiny dents in the armor and textures and every bolt and barbed wire and logs and every blade of grass and all kinds of stuff like that, um, and put it on a mobile device and switch it on AR. Now, the first thing is you cannot have a uh, mobile device get anywhere close to that visual fidelity. Not now, not then, not now, probably not for another 10 years minimum before they will catch up. But what came out of a hack ops before I joined was it could be done with streaming, which means if you stream the AR experience from a PC to a mobile device, you would be able to simulate AR. There was a lot of technical problems to get it to work. At the end of the day, uh, the modern iPad was just powerful enough. We managed to fake the uh, internet, uh, fake an Ethernet connection to it to get enough bandwidth to go down this cable that went into a camera adapter that went into a lightning part of the went into the back of an iPad uh, to send a streamed AR experience to the iPad. And that would take the player's um, uh, telemetry, so how they were holding the iPad and how they were pointing it, send that to an instance of World of Tanks, bring that back as a camera, and stream out the video to it. And it meant you, you could go around a World of Tanks replay and look at tanks from any distance, any size. You could zoom in on every blade of grass. You could pan right back out and see the full Eiffel Tower uh, in the background and see tanks getting blown up. And it was very cool. It was some very cool technology. It's not really practical to, for any uh, game endeavors just yet. Uh, but yeah, no, it was very good. Went to Gamescom, had, people had a lot of fun with it. And that was it. Well, Chi Long, who's in the chat, um, has a question, but was also there during the event. So saw, saw the live demo. Oh, um, over in Cologne, Cologne, Germany. Yeah. Oh, cool. And Chulong's question is, if the mouse isn't accurate enough and requires input smoothing, do controllers suffer the same fate? Uh, yes, controllers are their own beast. If you, if you are playing a controller game, it is in your best interest to figure out your controller model early. This includes dead zones and uh, amplitude, uh, acceleration curves, and how you basically handle that you have a very small range of movement that needs to translate to a very wide set of outcomes from the game. Um, the other thing is, this would be very hard in a prototype because all controls are different. I don't mean all types of controllers. I mean, every controller in their hand is different. Um, the hardware dead zones are different per controller. They degrade over time. And so that is something you, if you want it to be precise, and it is very important for your prototype for them to have precise uh, controller input, you probably want to have a setting somewhere that someone could tweak it to their needs. Um, but temper that. Most games do not need that level of precision. Basically, if you have a very fairly gracious dead zone on your controllers, it will count for 99% of controllers out there, or you can control the controllers they use. If they have high quality ones, they generally work better. Um, but yeah, having a dead zone and having a good acceleration curve on your controllers is essential and split your axes. Do not have the same acceleration curve for your X and your Y is the lesson there. Because people aim horizontally about four to five times faster than they aim vertically. Interesting. Um, I think we don't have any other questions. I think that might be it. Um, one other little comment, which I'll just make about the AR. Um, a version of that was used by, I think it was the History Channel for some yep. TV shows. Yes. Uh, not sure if the TV shows, they were on TV. Yeah. I think there was like there was a couple. The History Channel did at least some podcasts. They did a remake of the his, uh, Battle of Kurds, I wanna say. I'm sorry, my the specifics I am 
Vagon. But yes, they did yeah. it multi-part. They used the World of Tank engine because a lot of the World of Tank tanks are historically accurate. So they got all the tanks that would have been in the Battle of Kursk and they did some reenactments of the key moments in that battle, all in AR, that people could go around. I think you actually see part of that footage in the promo video, but they can be found somewhere. There's, it's yeah, pretty I think sure they're it's online channel. somewhere. Mm. Um, okay, we will start to bring things to a close. Um, if you want to ask any other questions of Luke, we're going to head over to the Games with Wings Discord channel. I am dropping a link to that into the chat now. Um, so we're going to hang out there for a little bit. Um, yep, if you do have any questions for Luke, he will be more than happy to answer them. Um, Luke, thank you very much for that talk. I've got plenty of people saying thank you, very cool. Everyone loved the chat. It was really, really informative. Um, yeah, we will see you over at Games with Wings in a couple of minutes. Thank you very All much, right. everyone. And next month, we are going to be back. I can't tell you what the talk's about just yet, but um, it is going to be by um, one of our team called Andrew. And he actually did a talk last year, um, which a lot of people liked, which was about time reversal. So I don't know exactly what his new talk is going to be about, but if you were around for that one, you'll know that it's going to be interesting. That is guaranteed. And we'll be putting up the meetup page for that probably next week. So keep an eye out for that. And like the video if you liked it. Subscribe to the channel if you want to be alerted when we do another one. Hit the notification button, all that sort of good stuff. And we will see you next month. Thank you very much.